up. Then the sailors became afraid, and every man cried to his God, and they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it. Okay. So this, this isn't a normal storm. This storm, the sailors, these are sailors, people that are, no, that are experienced on the Mediterranean Sea. And they're crying to their gods. They realize that this storm is a supernatural one. And I, I did some research, kind of, not really, um, on, very briefly, on uh, storms in the Mediterranean Sea. And it said that they, they get up to 90 miles per hour. And if someone wants to change that to kilometers real quick, I don't know. I, I see us education. Woo! Um, <laughs> okay, um, so 90 miles per hour, these storms were raging. And probably more than that, because these sailors were surprised, they were scared, and they were crying to their God. So this was not a normal storm, it was supernatural. And they cried to their God. So. Jonah has another response to God attempting to get Jonah's attention. Many times God uses storms to get our attention. And, and, and we, we, our first response to a storm is to try to get out of it ourselves instead of looking to God. And that's what Jonah does in this entire chapter. He tries to get out of the storm without God's help. He's fleeing from God in every way, even when there's a storm. And so... They were throwing the cargo out of the ship, and then the captain goes down, and he finds Jonah. What is Jonah doing? My goodness. Oh, no, we're staying. Right? Oh, yeah, Jonah's asleep. It's something. Jonah's asleep during the storm. I'm not saying sleep is bad. Sleep is not bad. Jesus said, come to me, and I'll give you rest. Physical rest, rest of the soul. Sleep is not bad. Um, unless you're sleeping during church. Don't sleep during church. It's not bad. Stay awake. Um, but Jonah's asleep, and I think this is more than just physical sleep. He's intentionally, he's ignoring God. God's trying to get his attention, and Jonah goes below, and he falls asleep. And this is a huge storm, and Jonah's sleeping. <coughs> so, many, we can become spiritually asleep. And by that I mean, we come to church, we listen to what's being said, but then we don't apply it to our own lives. We come to church, we sing the words of the song, but we're not worshiping and we're not glorifying God. We, we come to church from Monday through Saturday, we live a different life. And slowly and slowly, we get further away from God. And God tries to send a storm to get our attention. And Jonah, his response to the storm is to sleep. So the captain approached him and said, how is it that you are sleeping? How is it possible that you are sleeping? There's a huge storm outside. Help us. We're trying to throw this cargo overboard. You're being useless. So Jonah's sleeping and he's useless. My goodness. So the captain approached him and said, How is it that you can get up all on your God? Perhaps your God will be concerned about us that we will not perish. So, and this entire book shows God's sovereignty over any situation. God uses a non-believer that doesn't even believe in the true God to get Jonah's attention. He says, wake up. How could you be sleeping? Call on your God. Maybe your God will save us. And I made these PowerPoints last night. Is that really practice? Okay. Right. Okay. So each man said to his mate, come let us cast lots so that we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us now. On whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation? And where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? He said to them, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. So another way that God shows his sovereignty is through the dice. We roll the dice, but God determines the outcome. And God used anything to fit into his will. So. They ask him a lot of questions here. In fact, I think it's five questions. Yeah, five questions. And Jonah answers them with one general answer. Well, kind of two, but one basic answer. He says, I am a Hebrew and I fear the Lord, the God of heaven, who made the sea and the dry land. There is irony throughout this entire book, and this is one of them. Um, I, think, I think Jonah is starting to realize who he is now. And they're asking him, they say, who are you? Who do you worship? He says, Man, I, I, I fear the Lord, the God that made the sea, the one that we're floating on. I, 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 
I fear the Lord, the God that created the dry land, the one that we're trying to get to. And this, now, now it's starting to come to him. He's like, oh yeah, I messed up. Then the men became extremely frightened. So it's either something he said or the way he said it, but they understand that this is legit. This is something that is serious. This is, this is the real deal. Okay, this is, he says, it says, then the men became extremely frightened. Before they were frightened, it just says that they were frightened. Now it says that they're extremely frightened. This is the real God that this storm is coming upon. My goodness. So it says, then the man became extremely frightened and said to them, said to him, that, how could you do this? The men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told them. So they said to him, what should we do to you that the sea may become calm for us? The sea was becoming increasingly stormy, even more even stronger wind, stronger storm. He says to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that on account of me, this great storm has come upon you. However, the men rode desperately to return to land, but they could not, for the sea was becoming even stormier against them. There it is again. Instead of calling on to the God that created the sea and the dry land, they try to get to shore on their own strength. During the storm, are you trying to get to the shore on your own strength, or are you calling on to God? That should be our first response to pray to the one that created everything. So it says, Then they called on the Lord. Then they called on the Lord and said, We earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life and do not put innocent blood on us, for you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. Another little piece of irony here. The, the sailors, the non-believers, the ones that don't believe in the true God, call on the Lord before Jonah does in the midst of the storm. So they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. Then the men feared the Lord greatly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows again before Jonah fears the Lord. And the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. Now I'm sure in Jonah's mind, when he sees a big fish coming his way, he's like, oh great, I'm saved. This, this fish is going to eat me, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live inside the fish. It'll be great, and he's going to spit me out three days later. No, I think the, the prayer that happens in chapter 2 is a dying prayer. He, it's his last prayer. It, this is, he's inside a fish. That doesn't just happen. So, and God uses this to rescue Jonah. And God still pursues Jonah, even though he's messed up so many times. And I'll read the first verse of chapter 2. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the fish. So now that everything's been taken from him, he has nothing, nothing else he can look to, not himself, not to the sailors. Now he prays to the Lord. So God doesn't give up on us. Many times we fall back into either patterns of sin or sleepiness, spiritual sleepiness, and we think, oh, we've fallen too far, God won't listen to me anymore. But God doesn't give up on us. In fact, He gave everything for us. He sent His Son, who was Himself, down to this earth and gave everything for us. God doesn't give up. Jesus lived on this earth that He created, and He was mocked, He was ridiculed, and he still didn't give up. In fact, he was hanging on the cross and they mocked him while he was dying. And in his last breaths, instead of saying, you know what, never mind. You guys, you guys are filled with sin. You've rejected me. I'm going to restart. Instead of saying that, he looks up to heaven and he says, Father, forgive them, but they don't know what they do. And then he dies. And when we think all hope is lost, he still doesn't give up. On the third day, he rose again. Defeating death and sin. God doesn't give up. He's not in the business of giving up, especially on his followers. So first, we have to live prophetic lives, not in the sense that we're, we have divine revelation and we can see into the future, but in the sense that we're seeking the presence of the Lord on a daily basis. And we are to be willing to go to the uncomfortable places and do the uncomfortable things that God asks of us whether that be in your workplace or to a friend, or asking a friend to church, or just something nice that you can do for someone. The uncomfortable things. And then finally, I have not been changed. And finally, we are to remember that God never, ever gives up on us. 
بس فكر